G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with Warbles on about reproduction which is a clip for Jack Luck 4 and I've got to say by training I am in fact a registered general nurse retired um, last position of employment was Vegetable Creek Hospital at Emmerville and I trained from 1980 to 1984 at Repatriation General Hospital Concord where we received our obstetrics and gynaecology lectures from a time expired Catholic nun and among the many strange things that she taught us um, some of which we classed as old wives tales at the time um, she suggested to us that it was perfectly acceptable and safe for a woman to have vigorous sex and enjoy a deep vaginal orgasm during the first trimester of pregnancy as long as she didn't try to do this on the monthly anniversary or the lunaversary of when the period was due and uh, after the first trimester the old girl said that it was a bad idea to have vigorous sex or try and enjoy a deep vaginal orgasm because you'd basically run a high risk of a miscarriage she said um, in normal times the uterus is wired up for the woman to enjoy sex and to push the sperms up to where the eggs are and when the woman's pregnant the firing order of all those muscles and nerves is reversed and once it's reversed it's a bad idea to stir it up because all you're going to do is start a miscarriage well I might have taken it with a grain of salt when I first heard it but over the years as I had some experience and uh, when I got married I discovered that the old girl was right there are some times when it's okay to have sex with a pregnant woman sometimes when it's not and uh, about the time the marriage was broken up and going through the courts I happened to read in a magazine an article by a bloke called Dr. Karl Krushelnitsky and he's a medical doctor and he's the Julia Sumner Miller Professor for Science and Education at Sydney University and he generally knows his stuff um, and he'd come across some work where people had noticed that rats with the same immunotype are not interested in having sex with each other they'd been trying to do some experiment and this was an observation so they got further funding and they investigated a little bit further down that track and they discovered that sure enough if rats have got a different immunotype they're happy to have sex and they get pregnant fairly easily and they're nice and robust pregnancies but while they're pregnant the rats are not interested in having sex I mean he might be interested but she won't have a bar of it then those rats have a trouble free delivery and they have healthy little baby rats that grow and thrive and everything's fine and as soon as the female stops being pregnant she's once again receptive and interested in having sex with the male that made her pregnant previously and uh, they did some more work and they found that they absolutely couldn't get rats with the same immunotype to have sex they tried to fertilize them with IVF and found it was very difficult if they did achieve a pregnancy between rats with a different immunotype as soon as she was pregnant the rats suddenly became amorous and they shagged the pregnancy loose so in order to run that pregnancy to term they had to separate the male and the female um, it didn't stop the deliveries from being complicated and often obstructed and if they did succeed in getting a live birth from the rats with the same immunotype um, they found that the baby rat was underweight, undersized, didn't grow right, didn't eat right, you know, and the parents went back to fighting. So uh, that was considered almost alarming and more funding was sought. And they did a study where they got 600 women divided into three groups. There were 200 women who were not pregnant. There were 200 women who were pregnant and there were 200 women who were taking oral contraceptives. So their noses were pregnant and uh, they got 600 men to wear 600 t-shirts and the men were not to use deodorant and they were to wear the t-shirts for three days consecutively and they were to then put the t-shirts into Ziploc plastic bags and the bags were numbered and the men and the women were immunotyped and then the women were given the 600 t-shirts to sniff and no surprises here the control women said that the t-shirts of the men with the same immune system as them smelled yuck the t-shirts of the men with the most different immune system to their own smelt very yummy and uh, when they checked on these women's real life situation they found that they were in relationships with men who had a different immune system to them and when those women had been 
having babies, they had no trouble getting pregnant. They had a healthy, robust pregnancy, but their husband smelled like a pig while they were pregnant. And uh, they had a trouble-free delivery and their kids grew like weeds. They then had a look at the pregnant women and, again, no surprises, the pregnant women found that the men who had the same immune system as theirs smelt yum. The men who had a different immune system to the pregnant women smelt yuck. And those women said that their husbands had recently begun to smell like pigs, but they were too polite to tell them so. And, of course, the women who had a pregnant nose because they were on a hormonal contraceptive, yeah. Those women found the smell of a man with a similar immunotype to their own quite yummy. And uh, there we have the beginnings of a disaster which hit humanity in 1961 when hormonal contraceptives were released. Before the contraceptive pill hit humanity, the asthma rate was 5%. It immediately jumped to 25% within five years. Before the contraceptive pill hit humanity in the Western world, the divorce rate was 10%. It jumped to 50%. And asthma is an immunodeficiency style of a disease where an oxygen-breathing animal decides that the sex organs of plants which put the oxygen in the atmosphere are somehow poisonous, toxic and can't be tolerated. You know, it's, it's not a clever disease to have. However, it could have been worse. When I was a teenager, it was estimated that 85% of the young women were on the contraceptive pill because their parents didn't want them to get pregnant in high school. And the divorce rate was only 50%. I wonder what could have been um, ameliorating the situation? And my mind turns to cigarettes. If the young teeny boppers who are on the contraceptive pill when they're trying before they're buying are also smoking tobacco, then they haven't got much of a sense of smell. So the system has been randomised. And uh, they're probably picking their boyfriend on whether his eye colour matches their handbag on the night. But at the moment, the marriage breakdown rate is again on the increase, apparently because the medical community has succeeded in getting the teenagers not to smoke cigarettes as much. However, they've brought out a new hormonal contraceptive called an implant so that um, forgetting to take the pill is no longer much of an issue. So that, to me, I think it's a bit of a disaster. And a couple of years later, in 2004, in a New Scientist magazine, I read an article which explained what the old nun was getting on about with this um, changeover between the first trimester and the second trimester as to whether it was safe to have vigorous sex during pregnancy. It seems that... Um, during the first trimester, the foetus has a very small brain. The very small brain doesn't need much oxygen. Therefore, there's plenty of um, scope and capacity and room for prostaglandin to be used as glue to cement the placenta onto the inside of the endometrium or the uterus lining. So it's a pretty robust situation and the, um, the uterus can carry on spasming and enjoying sex as much as it likes and unless the uterus was set up to shed the endometrium on the day the period was due then everything stays pretty much in place but once the fetus gets to be three months old its brain suddenly blossoms in size and as the brain grows its oxygen demand rises in proportion and you can no longer afford to have you know half or two-thirds of the placenta endometrium contact area being taken up with glue so to get the gas transfer area, the prostaglandin is absorbed and the entire placenta um, chorionic villi attachment becomes more fragile. So there's the mechanism and in 2004 I suddenly got the scientists telling me officially that the old nun was right. It wasn't a wives tale, it was the bloody truth. And then in about uh, 2008 on Radio National Science Report and then I read it again in New Scientist there was a bit of research where somebody discovered that if a girl goes from being in nappies to puberty, being able to smell her biological father in the household, she hits puberty and has a first period years later than if she does not smell her biological father's pheromones in the house she grows up in. And we're talking 13 to 15 years old at first period versus 9 to 11 years old at first period if she can't smell her biological father. Um, apparently, if she has 
one stepfather and that stepfather is supportive and he doesn't abuse her, if he does all the things that a father is supposed to do, then she'll come halfway between the two extremes. But the hypothesis is that if the girl grows up smelling some other man's pheromones in the house but not smelling her biological father, it means that her mother has a breeding strategy of change partners and therefore it's a good idea for the girl to hit puberty early and uh, get out of the house and start her own household. Um, the girls who don't smell their biological father, 9 to 11 years old at first period and by 13 to 15 they are cycling fertilisable eggs and they can get pregnant. The girls who smell their biological father in the house, 13 to 15, before they have their first period. And they don't lay fertilisable eggs till they're 16 to 18. So they take a much slower approach to the breeding business. Now we've got a few minutes, so I'll try and cover a few of the um, mechanical factors involved in this system. During a deep vaginal orgasm, assuming the woman is ovulating and there's no mucus plug in the cervix, as the uterus and the vagina spasm um, out of sync with each other, one set of spasms creates a negative pressure inside the uterus and uh, simultaneously the cervix is pushed into the posterior fornix where the man's pool of ejaculate should be because if there's a deep vaginal orgasm it generally happens just after the man ejaculates. And then the counter-spasm acts to close the cervix and push the seminal fluid up towards where the egg is ideally going to be waiting in the fallopian tubes. Now they've done pressure tests on this and they've, they've done sperm counts above the cervix comparing women who did have a deep vaginal orgasm with those who did not have a deep vaginal orgasm. And the evidence is pretty clear, you know. A deep vaginal orgasm is a mechanism to push the sperms to where the eggs are. That's part one. Meanwhile, you've got your male in the natural form equipped with a foreskin, and the foreskin is actually a piston ring on a vacuum pump. You know, the idea is on the instroke, the foreskin folds down along the shaft. On the outstroke, the foreskin sticks to the vaginal wall, and it creates a strong low-pressure zone on the outside of the cervix, and this is supposed to extract another man's DNA from above the cervix because some ovulating women are promiscuous. And the idea is that if the bloke is having sex with a promiscuous woman, he needs to be able to extract somebody else's DNA before he puts his own there. And of course, the more excited the woman is, the more likely she is to have a deep vaginal orgasm. So we get into a corner of mechanics where the larger the penis, the better the fit, and the longer the man can keep it up, the better his chances are of... Um, reproducing for the next generation. Of course that's assuming absolute lack of knowledge on the part of um, the society. In the Australian Aboriginal tradition the young men are circumcised at the start of puberty when they are taught of the tribal skin laws and who they're allowed to breed with and who they're not allowed to breed with and because they're an educated population they're not going to need a vacuum flange. A degenerated form of this is practiced by the Jews, the Christians and the Islamics where they circumcise the babies. And uh, that's to symbolise to God they're going to raise the little boy to be a one-woman man. And then there's an even further degenerated form of it where some African tribes allegedly circumcise, well it's really a clitorectomy, and they cut the clitorises off their little baby girls so that she will never be able to enjoy sex so that a man with low self-esteem won't be afraid of having his wife run away and stray on him. Now to conclude with the old nun's advice for pregnant women who are worried that their husband might be likely to stray, she said, um, probably not a good idea to tell him that you're totally uninterested, she said Ask him for a back rub rather than having full sex and if he insists on having sex, educate him in the idea of approaching you from behind when you're lying side by side and explain to him that um, he's got to be gentle and you're not really that interested and you're really only um, cooperating with his desires for his benefit. And uh, ideally, he'll stay with you. Most men are not stupid. If you give them the choice, explain it to them, that they can have a baby at the end of the pregnancy or they can have vigorous sex now and risk a spontaneous abortion, most men will choose the baby at the end of the pregnancy. I hope that helps.
Ciao.